field. And, you, and, and there was a chair. All you can see is this chair, and there's no reference for anything else. Well, I would, what would I know about that chair? I would say, oh, there's a chair. I would say it's distance from me. And I would say it's orientation. But I really couldn't position it in any kind of angular reference frame. Um, it's interesting, as I turn my body, I don't perceive that the chair's position is moving. So clearly, it's, uh, I know that. Um, and then we talked about having two objects that are like that. And, uh, and then what would their, how would we do this? And, and what, if they, what if they were on a rug? So now I have a rug, and I have two chairs on the rug. Now, for some reason, it feels all of a sudden that, that I'm using the rug as a reference frame. That's, we talked about that. That would be all of a sudden reference frame. So um, uh, I'm, I'm going beyond your question. I, I guess my, my point is like those green arrows have a length and they have a direction. Yes. And you haven't talked much about the direction. No. Well, so I am talking about it now. So clearly there's an angle of displacement between these two, right? Um, and so you're just talking about the green arrows, not green necessarily the, the fact that those, are, those no. squares are oriented. The orientation is this, is this position here. Yeah. And that's not the orientation. The, the, when I say the word orientation, I'm talking about this. Yeah. Is the chair facing me or is it rotated this way, this yeah. way? Um, this, we decided to use the word angular position. You and I talked about that. So that was the term we used on Friday. Uh, okay. Right, to differentiate. Because you were, you were getting confused between orientation of this and orientation of this. And so I thought we decided to use the word angular. Um, angular position or, or direction or, uh, okay. So I'm just getting these terms. So, we're using so you mean the, by that you mean the angle from the sensor to some point on the object? Uh, yeah, well, that? okay, so we, this gets into the nitty gritty we haven't gotten to yet. Because there are multiple points on these objects, and multiple points on these yeah. objects. Yeah, and so the, the angular angle position, will change the the angle angle. position this is the same issue we have with displacement, so as we wrote about in the paper. An individual column, so imagine I look at this object, there's multiple columns observing that object. And so you can see that, like, uh, you know, there's some, yeah. some common things I'm doing. And then all the data, there's different columns observing that up. So uh, if we were to say the angle of the displacement, it would be, it would have to be something along the lines of an individual column's angle, which we're going to say has a position. So it's only sensing a small part of this. And then after you move, that thing's going to be sensing an, an angle, you know, something like this. And it's, that's the one only, it's that column itself that we're going to really pay attention to. Uh, we had the same issue in, that was, all, that was the whole inside of displacements, is right? Like an individual column is looking at a point on an object, and then a moment later it's a point on a different object. And you can say, what is the displacement of that column? But the, the entire object doesn't have a particular, you know what I'm saying? It's like, um, there's, there's no points. You can't do a point-to-point -point comparison on all the points on an object. An object doesn't have a point in space. All you can do is say is a column is viewing a particular point, and then a moment later it's viewing another point. That this same issue existed in the displacement cells, uh, and now it's going to exist in the angular displacement uh, as well. So um, that's the best I can say. We haven't walked through this mechanism, but there's a lot of parallels between, I think, between what we call the displacement of location. Which have the same issue about there's no really there's no point there's no origin in any of these things, um, and the same issue about the angular position of these two um, uh, is that uh, there's multiple points here. You can't say the whole object has an angular position to this, but you can say there's a displacement of angle between these two. And if you define displacement as saying um, um, I, I haven't walked so through it's confused. Be the same. I'm still confused. Is okay. it the you talk about the the green arrow, arrow yeah. the displacement. Are you talking about the I, angular displacement from one object to another object, or the change in angle that one column, if I'm looking at it, uh, let me, on an I object, think it's exactly analogous to what we did with displacements in our uh, in the framework. If I asked you, what but even it, with that, is it the what displacement it? from the sensor to the object or between the objects? Uh, like in this case, happening? it's this case. It's it's from uh, it's from this position here, right? Yeah. Um, and I can't say between the objects. Remember, in the displacement cells for location, the way we the way it's phrased is you can't ask, you know, is that is that the displacement of an object to an object? It's there's like a one point or an object. It, it, the, the object itself doesn't have any. Um, the displacement captures the relative positions of these things without saying anything specific about any particular point. Um, it's that was the, the beauty of it. Uh, and 
Mark is helping out if you don't no, know. No, no, I understand uh, that point. That, that makes so sense. So the same, thing, the same thing is happening here. Um, I can't say, just like I can't say, you know, two objects are so many, you know, inches apart for the displacement. I can't say these two objects are so many degrees apart this way. Uh, all I can say is that any particular column, if you if I if you know your if you know where it's on this object and I give you a displacement, I'll know uh, I'll know where it is on this object. Um, it, I, I try to over, over and over again. I try to make these parallels between orientation, head direction cells, and grid cells, and that they're really two different spaces, two different metric spaces. And and the only high level point I'm going to make is that the concept of displacement in a metric space of uh, grid cells is going to be very, very analogous to a concept of displacement in the metric space of orientation cells. Um, and I haven't worked throughout the details of that yet. Is that helping at all? So it, in my head, these green arrows are the direction and distance from the sensor to the object. Yeah, but, but simply like pointing out, there really is, there's no point on this object you can say that's the point of the object. There is no origin on this object. Right? Sure. So you can't really say it, 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 you, there is no answer. What is the what is the angular position between this object and this object? There is no answer to that question. Or just, you, just, but if we're just talking about one specific, well, but only if you assume there's an origin point on this object. No, no, no. Just like our displacement, we didn't assume an origin. Yeah, point, so there's still a displacement between yes, two objects. Yes, yes. The displacement can't be measured in angles. Just like the dis, uh, the displacement, you can't measure this displacement in degrees in the same way you can't measure the displacement between to look our existing displacement, you can't measure in terms of, of uh, you can't say how many inches apart two things are. Um, you just can't do that. Uh, it, there's no, you'd have to specify an origin to say, well, I want to say what's the displacement from here and here in our, in our current um, grid cell displacements. Uh, I can't say, oh, it's three inches. It's a, it's a function that tells you how to get from one point here to a point on uh, a point in this space, and a point here and a point in this space. Yeah. But there is no, you can't put a metric on it. You can't say it's inches in just the same way here. I cannot say how many degrees apart these are. So you have to be careful about that. You, it, it, there's no, it is a, it is a measure of in some sense like this to this, but there's no, you can't say this is 30 degrees rotated from this. That's, that's, that's not possible. Yeah, it's not a question about metrics. It's just a question of what are the two relative things you're comparing? Is it one object to the other or is it an object to the sensors? Is it two? In both cases, you could have. At this point, the only thing I'm starting with, it has to be based on this point of view here, right? Um, I have to calculate the displacement between G and these two. All I know is I'm measuring from here. I have um, I have information I get from here. I have information I get from here as I move, and so I I move through an angular distance. My sensor moves through an angular distance. My eye moves through some angular distance, um, and but. I need to figure out the displacement, the displacement of these two, um, first in an angular space and then in a, then in a metric space. Um, I don't know how to do that yet, uh, so I, I don't want to. This is a topic that needs to be delved into. What I'm excited about is the fact that I think this is a tractable, tractable problem that I can define the learning of an object, a composite object, without moving my my body. And all I can do is move the orient move the angular position of my sensors, or even imagine just one sensor, like you know, looking for a straw. I can say, okay, that's that's how much I'm going to move. Um, so I have an angular movement, and I have a distance. <clears throat> in, and you can think about the angle. Uh, sort of a, a global orientation for everything. That is, I have to have a sense of where, what is my. Um, I have a. I have a. Imagine my sensor here, like the straw that I'm looking through, or my head, if you want to think of it that way. Um, uh, it needs to know its relative orientation or relative angular position. Um, um, I've drawn these two arrows here. There, there has to be a, a sort of a 
preferred orientation for the for the parent object, and I have to share that. I have to, that has to be shared between me. I have to know my my angular position relative to this room, uh, in the same way um, uh, that these these things have to learn their relative orientation relative to the room. So there's a common grounding here in orientation, if you will, um, between these two. That was another conclusive thing. Uh, I, I think we're going to go with. Uh, I am not proposing the method for how to do this yet. I just, I, even, I haven't even attempted that yet. Maybe Marcus is going to try that yet in a moment. I'm just, I'm just letting it sink in a bit about the, 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 the problem here. The problem we're going to do is we're going to come up with a, a, an inference in, orient, in orientation space, like angular movement, uh, and turn that into, and so, and then we're going to turn that into uh, a displacement in sort of uh, an orientation in grid cell space in the object space. So it's, it's a, it, it just defines a transform that has to occur, uh, and I, I can take, remove the entire concept of moving my body around, that can be removed from this business no problem. Uh, where, that's where we started, that that was the, the main movement we had, and now I'm saying, no, that's actually not gonna do that at all. We're gonna not move our body relative to the objects, uh, we're going to be stationary. Now, all we're going to do is angular movements. Uh, and we'll be able to build this entire object model. That, I mean, that's just the statement of the problem. It's not an answer to the problem. To me, this is really exciting. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm still a little confused about the angular displacements and, and moving side to side. Like, these angular displacements are going to be specific to this location. Uh, the angular displacement between two objects is going to Yeah, be I didn't say that that's part of the object definition. Okay. But that's that's part of the problem, right? The problem is you're going it, to, it is clearly not part of the object definition. The object definition has no sense at all about your location, the view of the location. I started up front, right? The object definition has no concept of the location of the viewer. So we, but we start with a viewer position and we have to, we have to take this viewer centric convert position and convert it into an object centric position. And that's the task. Um, but to me, this is a huge, even though I don't know how to do that yet, this is a huge advance because I now have a different way of thinking about the problem. I you know, eliminate the idea that I'm even moving this guy. Um, and I just need to figure out what are, the, what are the transformations that have to occur to get from this position, this sort of view into an object model. That's, that's to me, the advance of the whole thing. Um, so the context where I brought up the term angular displacement was like if the orientation of these objects relative to this parent reference frame. Yeah. Uh, I was saying there's an angular displacement between this and this, and there's an angular displacement. Like if I drew yeah. a set of axes yeah. on this object yeah. and on this object, then I'm saying you can represent the orientation of this relative to the parent. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. As yeah. An yeah. 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 That um, makes sense. And maybe that's maybe I'm not being sloppy with the term. And that's independent of your viewer position. That's yeah. 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 Okay, so uh, I'm being sloppy perhaps with the language. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, the, the key thing here to me is uh, is defining the problem differently than we defined it before, and understanding why the finger, pro all the things we had were problems with fingers and touching in some sense could melt away completely by focusing on this problem. Um, and so it just, it just flips around the, the task. Um, uh, and, I, and I find that exciting. So even though I don't have a solution, just knowing the problem you're going to work on is sometimes 90% of what you have to do. Um, yeah. We did talk, we spent a lot of time about uh, the, this issue. I, I think it's worth talking about a little bit. We, and we've talked about this in the past too. When we define an object, are we defining the object as, no, I should use black. Um, there's two ways of doing it. Like there's a parent object, and then there's like child objects, you know? Uh, or the other way is you can say, no, it's just a bunch of, um, so there's child, 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 and a parent. Uh, or you could say, no, there really is just a bunch of uh, child objects, and even the even this room or rug is just another one of them. And as you go between these, you're learning the displacements between these guys. So either one, you're learning the displacement between the child and the parent, 
or you're learning displacement between uh, the individual children. And Mark and I discussed this a bit. There's, there's advantages to both of these. Uh, and it seems like we, at times you do both of them. Um, so if I just come into the room here and I see an arrangement of uh, plates on the table, I might just learn that arrangement by going like this, and I don't learn it in relative to some parent object. I don't make it part of the table. Um, it's just a temporary arrangement of things. It's like I walk into that white room and I see three chairs arranged relative to each other. I'm just going to remember the arrangement. Uh, but obviously, if I, if I see those three chairs on top of a rug like this or in a room, I, not, I might have, or three tables in a room, I might learn them as part of this room. Like there is a parent and there's children. This is far more efficient in terms of uh, storage. And um, it's also uh, really what you need for compositional structure. So you can be certain that this is occurring. And I think, I think what can happen, I, I haven't worked this out yet, but I think what, the, the basic idea is that when you attend to object to object to object, you're going to be figuring out the displacement between them in all cases. And, um, and there can be a time where, the, where the, the, that one of these is preferential. It's like if I was in a room or on a rug, it would be sort of a preferential one. So as I attend, I would also be, I always be calculating back to this one. Um, I, I haven't worked that through yet, but this is another issue we dealt, we dealt with. Uh, and I have a lot of little thought experiments I've been doing trying to tease apart exactly what's going on there. But my hope is that, that we can show that the, the same single cellular mechanism can do both of these. And if there's something that suggests one of these objects is, should be a parent object, then um, it assumes that role. But if there's no suggestion that one of them should be a parent object, then, um, then the system defaults to just uh, between the individual objects. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing there's a single mechanism that does both of these, that the physical attributes of the, act, the actual object to define whether it's one that's apparent. Just to give me an example of that, so here's like a rug and three chairs on it, okay? And if I see that, I would think that, I would, that the rug is gonna sort of become this parent role. I will see everything relative to that rug. If I had a small rug and I stuck it over in the corner here like this, and I had three chairs and a rug over here, I would no longer feel that way, even though there's still a rug, and there's still a space around the rug, and in theory I could have this as the parent object, and these things are just sort of nearby uh, in the space of the rug. But it's something physical about the rug itself which suggests that, hey, it's bigger and more encompassing. So almost all the examples of child objects that I can think of involve the child objects being inside or in, within the, the confines of the parent object. And I think that's going um, to that's that's play a role in uh, how, how it is we decide that. So um, there is these two different methods. Uh, Marcus has put this one, but we could do this with a union, this is what we do with temporal pooling, we can find an object as a set of displacements, and this one would be, we can might define an object as just a union of displacements. But I actually think the same mechanism can work in both, so that's what I'm going to work on. And I had a couple of... Um, um, Seems like there's another thing when we talk about objects that's not, maybe not quite captured there. What's that? Um, there you're kind of defining the rug as being the parent object yeah. and the uh, individual piece. But if you think about a coffee cup, there's, n there's you have the cylinder and you have the handle. There's nothing physical that's the coffee cup. It's an abstract notion of a coffee cup. And we're saying the handle, whenever you have a handle next to a you know, cylinder, that's... And the, you see that over and over again, that's a coffee cup. Yeah. So and it's, it's, you know, yeah. it's just like some so let, let's random say, thing that we associate Well, with. let's explore that a bit. First of all, we can agree that the, the logo is smaller than the coffee cup, yes. so there's a parent-child relationship right there. And if there was a coffee cup in the logo, that would be smaller than the logo, so the parent-child relationship. But now the question you're bringing up is the handle versus the cylinder. Yeah, that's the coffee yeah. cup is both together um, in that case. Yeah, so I don't know. It's a good question. Here's, here's some thoughts about that. First of all, we do see a lot of cylinders in the world without handles. That is, we see cups without handles all the time. We rarely see a handle without a cup. <laughs> so I just there is a there is a um, uh, d d discrepancy or dichotomy between those. They're not equal somehow. So I just, even though this one's not contained in this, uh, there is clearly a difference between those two. Uh, this is bigger than this one. Uh, they are attached. Uh, if I saw the handle out here, I'm not sure I would be able to make it part of the cylinder. So that's a good question. I'm, um, it's a good question. It, it, it's, yeah, it seems like there's, I have a notion of a coffee cup, which is yeah. not any particular physical thing. It's the combination of those things. 
the arrangement of the punch. Well, I'm just pointing out that if I if I were to say the coffee cup is, is a cylinder is a cup plus a handle, yeah, and that's how we'd even phrase it. There is a you know it's a cup plus a handle. It's not a handle plus a cup. So mentally in our mind there is a difference. This is smaller. I, I don't have the answer to your question. I'm just I'm just exploring yeah. the idea a little bit. I even thought about an interesting idea like this. Here's a imagine if you had four chairs, and I try to imagine um, this is just a, this is a continuing different uh, explanation of the same problem. Um, I have four chairs, and I imagine if I just had those four chairs randomly just dropped in the room randomly, some position. It would be very hard to remember that configuration. You're like, what's the configuration of those chairs? I go, like, oh man, it's hard to do. It's like it's just there's no there's no obvious reference frame in which to say that's the reference frame to place those chairs. Um, it'd be very difficult to remember that configuration. However, if I put the chairs down in such that there were three of them were in a clearly sort of rectilinear position like this, uh, and the fourth one could be anywhere, a random relative to that. I'd be able, it would be very easy to remember that uh, that arrangement. I would see these three chairs as defining the, sort of the parent in some sense. It's, uh, it's like the Kinenza uh, triangle or something like that. You, know, you, you would see there's a rectangle here, even though there isn't one, um, because some of the objects to sort of beg to define one. And so it's like it's interesting just to notice that okay, four chairs in one arrangement, four chairs in a different arrangement. These four chairs, I can easily remember them. And I think I can easily remember because I would just imply that this is sort of the parent object. There's these three together seem to be um, together. They, they, they don't seem to be randomly arranged. And therefore, these guys have preference over this guy. I don't see this guy as the parent. I see these three defining a parent region. Um, so I mean, there's little thought experiments you can do like that, which sort of tease apart like, well, there is no larger object here. But clearly, I see there's an implied one. And, um, and so I, now I would be able to learn this. And if I didn't have an implied one, I just can't learn it. It's really, really hard to more randomly place chairs to learn what their configuration is. Um, so I, I think there's, there's clues in this. Um, I don't know the answers to that. Um, and that's all I can say about that is that there, there seems to be a, and so this reminds me a little bit of the coffee cup in the sense that, well, if I look at it as two objects, uh, one of them clearly seems to be more dominant than the other, and it says, suggests, pick me. <laughs> you know, it's like, pick me. I'm rectilinear, and I have the bigger thing, and I, I exist in the world independently of this little guy, so pick me. I'm, the, I'm your reference. Um, even though it's not contained in the other one. So um, yeah, it, it'd be a little bit like saying, how about if I had a rug? And then I had four chairs, you know, positioned around the outside of the right, like three chairs like that. Uh, how would I remember the juxtaposition of those things? Well, I would probably see it as these three chairs well through the rug. I'd still give this the parent. I would say, oh yeah, in this room they arrange the chairs on the outside of the rug. But, but that, you know, but again, why is that different than this one down here? This one I have three chairs in a rug. Uh, but in this case, the rug is small. In this case, the rug is big. And there's something about that I think that that sort of clues you into. Um, which one of these is more dominant in some sense? It gives you a suggestion. Which one is more rectilinear? Which one gives you the, the brain maybe just tries to figure out what should be the, the, the parent reference frame um, and, um, and goes with that. So these are, I think these are all problems. I guess obviously now the problem that I, I want to work on uh, uh, is, is two here. One is um, one is just the problem of representation. How do I represent an object um, uh, where I have a set of displacements relative to some parent re reference frame, and those displacements have to include location, orientation, and scale? So that's just a, a representational problem. And then the second problem is how do I learn that from a particular viewpoint um, uh, you know, without moving my body, just by changing the angular position of my, my sensor or sensors, um, and uh, and it's it's interesting in this case that you know that anyway that's that's, that's uh, there's sort of two separate problems here that you try to solve at the same time. So that's all I was going to talk about. This is my question, Marcus. You want to talk about? Yeah, I can build on that. All right, all right. I yeah, why don't you do that? Say some stuff that connects to it. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll start from. Um, 
I'll talk about these green arrows uh, and the I don't know the interesting idea that these um, that a location or you could call it a distance and a direction from a sensor to a uh, to what it, to what it's sensing um, does it, it can be in there. There are different reference frames you could imagine it being in. One is being in the sensor's reference frame. Another is being in the reference frame of the of the. We'll call this a child object. Um, or the, the third option is that it's. Uh, I don't. This is this isn't immediately obvious that like a vector can also be in um, a location relative to an object can be in a totally, it, it can be an apparent reference frame. And that's kind of what we're getting at here, is, is part of what, what you're getting at here, is that um, these green arrows aren't in the reference frame of the sensor or the child object. They're in the reference frame of the parent. Parent object, object. yes. Yeah. And, yes. Um, and yeah. like, I've, I've mentioned, I've drawn this on the board before, but. Um, that's, is that, I'm gonna make sure I double check it. That's equivalent to like the green and the black arrow the same there. That, that's what was, I think that's what I meant by that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 My, um, the green is my reference frame for where I'm facing, and it's the same as the reference frame of the yeah. object. Yeah. Um, and inspiration for this comes partly from um, I, I, brought, I brought up um, object vector cells of paper that came out a couple month and a half ago or so, or so but they've been presenting it for a couple of years. Um, object vector cells in entorhinal cortex uh, and uh, and I'll, I'll mention it's old. Um, they found it in mouse entorhinal cortex. Uh, I, to my knowledge, it has not been found in rat entorhinal cortex. Uh, so that, that's partly why it took so long for me to find it. So I had to go to a different animal. Um, and I've drawn something like this on the board here. I'll use I'll use a shape that's not um, as symmetric, or I'll, I'll do something that can be rotated. Uh, so object vector cells can be imagined really. Each one of them represents a possible green arrow. Uh, so, uh, so I'll, I'll draw them in green for that reason. Um, so there might be a cell that has a firing field here, another one that has a field here, uh, etc. Uh, and you can pretty much draw a bunch of these around the object. And each of these is, you can imagine a green arrow extending from this point to that object. And the cell would will fire when the animal is standing in that green circle. In any, the animal's orientation be any orientation. Uh, is this, right, the animal yeah. facing any green that circle. Yeah, um, and I guess I'll just, I, I'll, I'll draw the environment as a big square around it. Um, now, these cells, it's interesting, just, it, this is gonna all come back to things I said here. Um, if you rotate the object, the cells, the firing fields stay fixed. Uh, the firing fields don't rotate with the object. Uh, if you rotate the environment, uh, then, uh, or or if you put the put, if you put this in a different environment, where the animal's head direction cells are rotated compared to this one, uh, then the cells do rotate with it, uh, which all suggests that basically the green arrows are in a in an external reference frame. They're in like the parent reference frame. Uh, so this just, it, it brings up like, um, it's, it's kind of thought provoking that, okay, we know this type of location exists and- This kind the, of cell. Yeah, this, this, type of, this type of cell that represents this sort of vector distance. Um, and so is it, so that one of those green circles would respond if the object is at some relative angle from the head direction cells? from the ang yes. some yes. canonical head direction. Yes. So the canonical dis angular displacement and distance. And Which is kind of like, the, that's what you said, it's like a yeah, green yeah. arrow down there. But then if you rotate the environment, um, is that same grid cell at still the same relative angular offset from the head direction cell, or does it like completely rotate? Same angular? object vector cell. Same, same object vector cell. Yeah, same object yeah, vector uh, cell. They, and they have a, in the paper, they do have a nice figure that shows exactly that, that um, this is sort of very, it's very much intertwined with a particular head direction cell. Okay, um, so it's always at a, at a fixed relative angle from the head direction. Yeah, yeah like if, if uh, it's, it's hard to no, say. No, 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 not from the head direction. 
It's hard to stick this Independent precisely. head direction because it's, 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 it's no, no, the head, uh, it's head direction quite, itself. The head it's, direct, the animal can be spinning in a circle here and this cell always is firing. Yeah. What's no, 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 I know. I know. Okay. That's why the. It's, uh, what, it's, it's particular to this uh, particular orientation of the moon. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I'm, uh, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. 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 Another way to put it is, Another point is if you if you do this if you do a series of circles that are all equal distance from this thing around here, that cell only fires in one of these positions. It won't fire in any of these other positions. Yeah, no, no, I understand that. My question was that then when you rotate the environment, the the angle that this represents the object relative to the head direction cell canonical angle is always the same angular offset, right? It's in this particular form. No, when you rotate the environment. Uh, the head, I don't think head direction cells are missing that. So, it, like, if you want, there are different ways you could state this precisely, but, like, um, one is to say, uh, if, you, if you train the animal to always rotate and face the object, then, oh, gosh, gotcha, it's so hard to say it precisely. But if, if you, if you train the animal... Well, you're saying the rotation of the animal doesn't matter. No, I know, I know, but I'm saying, like, if you did that, if you, if you train the animal to always face the object, then, um, then this would always fire with a particular head direction cell. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but, but that's that. We don't want to do that. That's uh, all. Yeah. We want to avoid yeah, that. Yeah. I'm just trying to make. It's it's sort of like thought thought experiments when I was doing this little thought experiment here, and I was imagining looking at this chair. Even when I turn my body, my perception of the uh, of the the chair's position isn't changing. It's changing relative to my face. But my, my sense of where it is, I don't feel, when I do this, I don't feel that chair is moving, right? I know the chair is not moving, even though it's swinging around like this. So it's, I think that's, that's captured in this. It's like... Yeah, so I get that. My so I have a was, sense of where it is in this room, not where it is relative right. to me. No, so I get that. My question is, how does that cell respond then again in, the, in a new environment where you, know, you have a different... Uh, if the same yeah. object... You are in the same uh, position relative to the orientation of the room relative to that object. I think that same cell would fire. That was my question. Yeah. Yeah. Fire, yeah. Yeah. But that tells you a little bit about the mechanisms. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. yeah. And this set of cells is um, uh, the, um, they they kind of stay mapped in this in the same in the same way. Uh, and this cell is always next to this cell, which is up in. Yeah. 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 Okay. And I assume, way I assume yeah. that these are actually. Uh, Sparks codings. I mean, there's almost everything like this. Yes. These, these cells, in theory, would respond in other places too. Oh, and and in, pra in practice, they do. Some of them yeah. do have multiple fields, but yeah. if it's, yeah. a, it's like it's a population, the same like clay cells have multiple fields too, right? Yeah. They, they didn't realize that up front, uh, but they do. So, so again, this individual cell is going to respond in multiple of these positions, but it's some set that's going to be unique, and, and they're going to be very sparse around here. So, individual cell may not respond mm -hmm. again in this particular object. Um, <laughs> So, uh, I see this, and what I immediately want to um, reach for, what I immediately want to try to make work is, um, is well, if we know this kind of thing exists, uh, that suggests, I'll just redraw just a picture here, because I, I want to draw different arrows. Um, I didn't want to draw all those arrows, but then I was forced to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to draw different ones. Uh, so, now what, what I want to, uh, I'll just draw a black dot for the sensor, and um, uh, might as well just draw the two of the same shapes. You don't want to use green? I was using green for body. Oh, sure. I can do that. I mean, it was just going to be a dot anyway. I don't know, but um, it just helps them remember what it is. Sure. It's different. Uh, it's not, I was using black to be part of what the object is, and green is what uh, what's my current body thing. So I, so, um, what I want to immediately do when I see this is, um, I'm like, okay, so I can, I have a cell that responds when I'm at this, um, this distance and direction from this object, and, it, and uh, when I attend to this other one, I get a different one of these arrows. Um, well, naturally, what I want to do is take the displacement between those arrows uh, to try to get the, um, to, to represent the relative location between these two uh, these two objects in a way that's invariant to my location. That's right. That is the key. Uh, so I, I see this, and and then I and then my reflex is be careful. Let's see. Do will that actually work? As you said it, that wouldn't work. 
I, th I think I know why you might be saying that, because it's probably the same conclusion I'll reach. But I mean, it wouldn't work. It's not doable, you're saying? You no, 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 no. So what do you no, mean? No. Just, uh, just the precise words you used oh. won't give you the, the displacement between the objects. It'll give you the displacement between the individual points you're sensing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. yeah. So, so what I want, what I'm glad they did in this study, or they they did uh, to some extent, but they didn't they didn't really push on it very hard. So I still don't know. The big important question is: Are these arrows to some reference point on the object, so, so some common point on the object, or are they to the perimeter of the object? Are they to some? Uh, uh, I think neither. Uh, Well, well, just as a, just a, I guess uh, perimeter would be the right answer. Maybe, uh, yeah, fo focusing on this just like analytically, like the this idea of taking this displacement. Um, well, maybe it's just intuitive to you that um, that um, if well here, here I'll draw it as I'll draw it as um, so two two different objects. One is just tiny. One is large. Um, and say uh, I'll, I'll just stick with your scheme of. Green for agent. So, yeah, so actually the dotted line you drew there should have been black because that's part of the object sure, model. I thing. guess that's fair. Uh, <laughs> I, I, can, I can fix that next time someone else is talking. About I like this. It helps you think about yeah. the colors. Imagine if we had more colors. No, then it would be harder. Two is perfect. That's blasphemy. Uh, <laughs> and I'll draw a second one with dotted lines. Uh, dot, dot, dash, there are dashes. Uh, and Coordinating multiple things here. Okay, um, so j just to s state this, like, so we have two blue and green dots. What are two two different sen possible sensor okay, locations I see, I see. for viewing these. And I mean, I could I could just for okay, fullness of it, yeah, The displacement between them. One of them is going to look something like that. One of them is going to look something like uh, like that. Um, displacement between two two what? The the displacement between the two dashed arrows is going to be something like this. Uh -huh. The displacement between the two solid arrows is going to be something like this. Because um, the perimeter is, is yes. so large. Where if these arrows had been to the center of this object, it would be, the, the, same. Would be the same. Yeah. Um, and so what I wanted to know, and they, they do so show some data from this experiment to suggest, um, is it to the center or is it to the perimeter? Uh, and th the experiment they ran, spoiler alert, they concluded <laughs> perimeter. Um, no, no, I mean, but it's, that's bad for us. It would no, be, no, no, really no, nice because, because we, we knew we, a long time ago, after I beat myself on the head over this and made a fool of myself, that we concluded there cannot be any reference points anywhere in the system. So I know, it would be nice if there were. But it can't be. But, be, the, no, it, it, but they, are, they don't have to be reference points, but there are location spaces that are that have some orientation offset. Yes, but the there's no preferred points yes. anywhere. Yeah. So but even if it's our job part, right. but, but if there were location mm -hmm. spaces, those the the relative orientation between them should also be same in both of these cases. The, ori the relative actually, orientation is going to be constant between them. Yeah. But That's what the, I said. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Unless you have deformed objects, like the, the right, right. So we're not I actually them. don't think it's going to be preserved because I didn't put that as part of the object model the deformation. Uh, so anyway, I. Going back to Marcus, so one thing I've always said is that when you, when you, at first, everything that gets harder and harder and harder because you find these constraints like, oh, this is harder than I thought it was going to be, so like not having a record number. But that turns out to be the clue to understand the ultimate answer. So I'm actually happy that it seems harder not having a reference point because it is a forcing function to tell us to think differently about the problem than we would have thought of. And we're going to have to think about that. So knowing that that's true is better than not knowing it's true. Because otherwise we would go down a rattle, which I did before. So. And and I'll I'll say they didn't they didn't say this emphatically. I had to read the paper carefully to to reach this conclusion. But the experiment they ran is they tested with different objects. They tested with cylinders of different radius, basically larger and larger cylinders. Uh, and then, yes, I'm drawing a wedding cake. Um, <laughs> so um, it's a cheered football. <laughs> yeah. um, and so. Um, I drew this conclusion that um, that it must be relative to the perimeter because basically in the small print of their paper they said that um, that 
the distance of the fields relative to the perimeter of the object was uh, was highly correlated. Uh -huh. um, they didn't make any um, um, the, any actual statement that like it wasn't when we tried with the center of the object. Um, did they and, talk about the issue about is there a center reference point or is there a perimeter? No, they, 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 they didn't talk about they it. They just said, by the way, it looks like. Di it's different parts of the paper, they, they used the center. Other parts of the paper, they used the perimeter. Um, part of that is because some of these objects are skinny or, um, or, or complicated shapes, so it's weird for them to try to guess at the distance to the perimeter. Yeah. So the point is, they weren't, see, it wasn't the top priority for this paper to answer this question. And I'm yeah. trying to get this information out of it. They were just trying to lay out this initial yeah. discovery of these cells. I think, but this this is this is the task right here, and I think it's a definable task that we have an observable point, we have a distance. Yeah, but I, I think I think it'd be good to replace it with black dotted arrows. Yeah, yeah, sure. that, 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 that defines <laughs> the task. Yes, actually, yeah. I just didn't want to overwrite it. That's right. And, and somehow, in the individual columns observing this point of the perimeter and this point of the perimeter, and other columns observing these points and these points, together they figure out the entire displacement vector, uh, which we don't know how to do that yet. Um, but that is the task. Yeah. Uh, and I find it exciting, really, really exciting. I'm so happy about this. Um, Let me ask a bizarre kind of question. I'm not sure this. So we're saying there's no reference point between the two. Uh, between two, two, two between the two, there's no reference point on any object. There's no preference yeah. reference. Yeah, there's yeah. no origin. No origin. Um, and typically, you know, when you use origins to compute the relative displacement between two reference frames, but we're saying there's no origin, but yet you can have relative displacements between these location yeah. spaces, right? Yeah. Do we need say the same analogy could hold for orientations? Do we we yes. do we need a reference orientation? We may not need a reference orientation at all. It may just be that there are orientation spaces, and we can talk about the relative orientation of these orientation spaces without any single reference orientation. I think you can, but but on the other hand, to build the object model, you have to have a parent orientation. So I think you can take two isolated chairs in the white room. But do you need a parent orientation, or do you need a parent orientation space? Because with locations, you don't need a parent origin. You just need a parent location space. I guess uh, I don't know how to answer that question. Um, I mean, the, the thing about orientation is a closed space, right? So um, I, 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 yeah, I go around, and, and so um, I, I don't even know. I, I, I'm I just saying that maybe we don't that. need a reference orientation the same way we don't need an origin. Well, I, I think I think what we need is a an orientation that is aligned with the parent object, and whether you call that a reference orientation or not, I don't know. I think you need that. I know you need that. We know that it exists. Um, I mean, an, an arrow always has to be in some reference frame. Uh, yes. Uh, so, the, yeah. Anytime you have an arrow, you already have chosen a reference frame. But uh, the, but the same thing with location spaces. Anytime you have a location activity, you have a chosen yeah, but, but Mark, uh, but that doesn't mean that I, say, I can have two arrows and I can say what the displacement between them is without having any other knowledge about any other thing in the world. And I think one of the conclusions we reached, and it's obvious in the neuroscience, is like head direction cells always anchor to the to a particular reference in an environment. And so there is this, and, and we concluded we needed that. I think that's yeah, the but you had <laughs> yes, but you have different. You have a bunch of cells that correspond, that are all anchored to the same orientation, canonical orientation, but there's no single orientation that's privileged that's, over one that's, another. That's correct. That's right. They all yeah. have to be they that's what anchored. There's okay. no privileged. Well, for, if, you, if you want to say, for example, there's a bunch of orientation cells, 10 direction cells. Um, some are going to be active when you're facing this way, some are going to this and this way. Yeah. None of them is preferred. No, none of them is preferred. But they're all, there's some, they're all anchored. Yeah, so I think the, the, the trick here is, is, yeah. Remember I've always made the comment that orientation cells in the cortex seem to go through all the columns? So it reminds me of that. It's like saying um, that the orientation cells that I'm going to be used for myself and for these objects and for the room somehow are all anchored together. Um, or something like that. It, it, it's, I'm not saying that exactly, but 
they, they, there's no preference, but they get re anchored together. Yeah. So yeah. whenever I'm in this room, even though I'm moving around relative to the room, I'm going to have the same cells active when I'm facing this way. And the objects in the room, uh, when, uh, the, I, 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 don't, I don't know how to even say beyond that. All I'm just going to say is that, uh, that, that, that they're all going to re anchor somehow. Somehow there's going to be re anchoring to the room. There is a preference to re anchoring to the sensory environment of the wider object, the room. Um, and that's going to be shared among these things. That's going to be like the glue that holds them together somehow. I, it's a fuzzy idea, but um, but there is no preferred. You're right. There's no there's no really way of saying this is the right direction. It could be. I could have drawn that green arrow like this. Yeah. I could have mm -hmm. drawn the green arrow like this. It's just that whenever I'm in that room, the cell that represents this, in a, it, it, I don't know. It's all relative to the same. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. It's there's no there's no preferred orientation. It's just an anchored orientation. Everybody gets anchored. Um, uh, can I ask a silly question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> we make the plot experiment in the top right for randomly placed chairs. Yeah. So the reference frame needs to be like a, an existing physical object. Can can it just be like a point I imagine? Like I see a cluster of chairs. Yeah. But I just imagine there's like a cluster and there's a center of that cluster. And I can see there's a there's a displacement of location and orientation regarding to that center of the cluster. But the center doesn't exist. It's just something I'm imagining. Like I'm. Yeah, I think. Yes, yeah, so I, 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 if I understand what you're saying, Lucas, it's, it's like, um, the imagine if I had four chairs that are like, you know, just perfectly aligned like this. The the point is, I see that as a thing. I don't see it as four things. I see it as a yeah, thing. it's like a cluster of things that it's I. See a, it, well, it's like not a cluster. No, I'm saying I see it as like a rectangle. It, it's it's a little bit like the you know the Kinenza triangle where they have um, you know like these circles like this and uh, and you, and you see the triangle but there is no triangle. Uh, <laughs> it's sort of like there is no rectangle here but you see the rectangle. It's this it's, it's, this is this is sort of an odd rectangle in some sense. So what I think was your what your brain is it latches onto these three things and says oh that's that's part of a, a, a rectangular thing. I see that as a thing, even though it's not connected to the proper rectangle, but I right. recognize it somehow. And now this one is somehow relative to it. So it's like imagined, but it's not purely imagined. It's based on some physical evidence. Clearly, if I, if I started making these chairs wider and shallower, um, pretty soon I'd have a rectangle, you know? So <laughs> and the basic, one of the reasons people think we see these is uh, the chance, if they, either there really is a rectangle or a triangle or there isn't, and the chance that three things would line up exactly to form a triangle is so small yeah. that there isn't really a triangle yeah. that we're yeah. just assuming there's really or, a triangle. Uh, or in our language, you might say there's a bunch of columns that are seeing these angular and lines, voting, yeah. and they're voting even though there are columns that are missing and aren't voting. There's enough columns that are voting saying triangle that we see triangle. Yeah. Uh, that would be, be the neuroscience explanation for that, right? Our, our, uh, our voting mechanism. So, yeah, so it doesn't have to be real. It just, it, it just has to be implied, enough implied that there's enough voting going on. There's enough of these cells saying, hey, there's something there. I, we're going to say there's a rectangle or the rectangular field or something like that. Um, so, so the reference frame could be like the, the center of this imagined object, right? I, it wouldn't be the center. It would be. Like it, our, right? it would be. Remember the container. container. It's container. just. It's just. Uh, you might think about if I have a representation for rectangles. Uh, this is fuzzy. The I'm rectangle sure. would be an object. There'd right? be an object. Yeah. yeah. It'd just be an object. Um, there is no center to it. It's it just defines its own set of uh, uh, point fields that is unique. Uh, it took me a long time to get over the idea that there's, rep, you know, origin. There's no origin. There's no reference. <laughs> Guys could beat me up about that. Um, yeah. So I think what basically goes on is we, as we attend to different objects, we uh, we we calculate the displacement between them constantly, uh, and that's the displacement between them relative to a parent object. If there is a parent object, if there is no parent object, it's just be, somehow it's just between the individual pieces. But it's the act of attending the different objects, like the different chairs in the room, that literally just builds up a set of displacements relative to the parent object. 
and it doesn't matter where you do that from. So I would end up with the same displacement at any viewing point in the room. If I look at object A and object B, it doesn't matter where I'm in the room, I have to end up with the same displacement between those, between those objects in the parent and the object in the parent. That's the problem. And, and all this talk of representing where an object is and how it's oriented. The one thing that would be just so nice to know about the brain, about some somewhere in the brain, is does it ever have, um, does it ever represent a location and orientation in such a way where, like, right now you're looking at this marker, and I mean, it's this fix. Um, and right now, right now, it's it's location staying constant, but its orientation is changing. Yeah. Uh, and does that happen in the brain? Uh, is is there um, sure. is, is that possible for an orientation of something to change without without its location? Changing. Well, 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 so its location relative to you is not changing. It's your your location relative to it is changing. And this is where we always got into the problem of that, sure, right? Yeah. So, but it's obvious to me. It seems obvious to me that the location relative to me is not changing. Its orientation relative to me is changing, but its location relative to me is not changing. Even if I turn my head, its location relative to me is not changing. Um, so the thing is that implies that there is an origin. Why on the object? Uh, even though you may not have explicitly explicitly chosen it, there is some point on this object that if it rotates about that point, the location of the object is not changing. Oh, 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 oh. Um. Hmm. And I could I could bring up a second. Uh, okay, a second so way of uh, okay, that. I think then we should stop using that language. Oh, um, what do you mean? Well. Uh, I think the trick to understanding all this stuff is never to think about the object. Uh, in many situations, it's not thinking about the object as a whole, but think about what part, the like, exact little part that's being sensed by a column. Okay. And there's many columns object, observing that object. So now we have to ask the question, if I have you know, a thousand visual columns observing this object, as it rotates, um, individual columns will see things as further and closer and further away, and, uh, and we'll be seeing different parts of that object. And so um, I think if I if I if I do a temporal pooling over all these changes, there's something that's stable. Stability does not imply that there's a point. It just uh, it just implies that there's a, a stable representation of that thing, even if it's. Um, I'm trying to make up words to yeah. describe this. That's a really interesting question. <laughs> so if you so you're saying as I turn it here, the location relative to me is not changing. Right. Okay. What if I rotate it this way? Yeah. Is the that's location the relative to me changing? I mean, that's, that's the question. <laughs> if we say no, then there is no origin, but if we say yes, there is. Because that now the rotation point is different. Yeah. I, 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 I think I, 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 I'm going to work on this. The, I'm still going to uh, banish any of my, least my thinking, any thought of, of reference points. And, and the answer is always going to. I mean, this is what the, the displacement sound like this showed. It was like it showed how you could represent the position of two objects without having any reference points. I don't have any reference points. There's no origins. That was the beauty of the whole thing. But it seems for any, um, if we're going to add orientation to that. Uh, at that point, you start needing to measure distances from an origin from a reference point. Uh, I don't think so. Um, th that was the same thinking that went into understanding the, the relative position of two objects. We start off thinking that way, and then the displacement mechanism showed that wasn't necessary. So we have to figure out how it's not necessary here too. I mean, we already did it once. It's like that was brilliant. So, so <laughs> let's figure out the equivalent here. So the, the second version, a second thing that's similar to that orientation thing I just said, similar to the, the thought experiment about like what if this rotates about some point, etc. Um, I can also um, the okay, this marker as is at a current location right now, current um, direction and distance relative to you or relative to something. How about if, instead of saying it's at a current distance and orientation, we say that it's just it's not changing. 
my perception of it is not changing, which is not the same as saying. Well, that's going to destroy my, uh, what I was going to say after okay. that. <laughs> so <laughs> because now, now I'm going to replace it with an eraser <laughs> yeah. and say like, um, is there some way, does the brain ever represent where an object is in a way that it'll, it'll, rep, it'll activate the same cells right now as it's, as it's activating right now? Well, that's like the work pathway. Isn't that like almost the definition of the work pathway? Like a cartoon version of the wear pathway. Yeah. I don't know if cells that do that have actually been found. I think the thing is wear pathway. Here's what, here's what, I, I think it's, it's, from what I, again, I don't know the literature as well as I should, but I think it's very similar to that, but it's, it's not specific to the object identity, but it is specific to the object kind of shape and okay. things like that. So if, it, if you had two different, completely different rectangles, it would still be the same, but something that's curvy might be represented differently. It's it more like how you act on it. So yeah, here's that's here's another saying. thing to think about. Imagine I go out and I want to reach for an object, right? You might say, well, I need to know where the object is. And I'm going to say, no, you don't. You have to know where the object is relative to each part of your skin that's going to touch. Each part of the object, each part of the skin has to know where the part of the object is going to touch. You don't go through some centralized distance and location. It's more like every part of your hand has a position relative to an individual part of the cup, and each one has to figure out how to, it's going to grab its particular part of that cup. There's no central location of where that is, um, and that's that's the trick. The motor behavior. The trick. The motor behavior is that these fingers are moving independently, and it's not like oh, my hand is at X Y Z and cups at X Y Z. It's no. It's my fingertip is someplace, and the thing that's going to touch is someplace, and it, there is no local. There is no centralized uh, position. Um, I think we have to banish that idea, uh, and that's going to be the trick to understanding um, motor behaviors. Um, it's going away, you know, thinking in that same sort of um, decentralized way. Hmm. More questions, Lucas? I have a bunch, but there are all silly questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't mind looking silly up here. Uh, you think we don't ask silly questions? <laughs> I, I have to read more for that. Uh, you know, it makes me feel like a lot of what we wrote in our first columns papers is, you know, is, well, we knew what those errors were, there, but now we know better what those errors are. Um, it just seems like, oh my gosh, this is so far from what we started with, but it's better. I really feel like presuming it. This is getting close to the ultimate answer here. I'm going to run out of the conductors to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Anyone else want to talk about anything? I don't know. I mean, there's, there's like uh, kind of mathematical ways of thinking about all of these problems, that, but they all kind of depend on origins and stuff. But there's a lot of these concepts are very clearly kind of defined in that. I don't know if it's helpful to well, you know, I was wondering, kind of I was hoping you might jump up when we, when I drew that picture or we drew this picture here and say, oh, that's a simple transformation to do. I mean, um, it is, but it's, it is a simple, but it's, it requ that those things just, all require, have origins. Well, let's talk about it as if there's an origin. Let's, let's imagine, for example, there's a point here and a point here. So we have three points. Um, what, what is, what is the simple, Calculation: You go from this vector and this vector to that vector. Well, that's a vector difference. Okay, so it's a vector difference. Um, I want but, to but do it in Well, to get the black arrow, it's a little bit. I don't want different. to do this in x, y, and z. Well, I want to get the black arrow, and and I don't, I don't want to. Well, the mathematical stuff all has origins, so they all have x. Well, can I just say that this point here and this point? Oh, you're saying I have to. Like, yeah, but then the difference between this point and this point is different, but what we want is the relative position. No, I'm just saying, I'm just to give you, I'm going to give you two points, the three points here, um, and... You just want this vector? Well, that's just the difference. Well, but it's, I want to do it with, it's, uh, it's not just a vector distance, because I have a, I have a, an angular change and I have a, uh, a distance change. I, I'm not yeah, but they're both captured by this vector. Yeah, okay, so how would I, here. so what would I, so imagine I have two components of this vector, right? Um, uh, let's say let's say I have a reference frame for here's my here's my reference orientation. So I have this is some angle here and this is some angle here. Um, 
So I have uh, I have a distance in this, and then um, I have some I have some distance one here, and I have some distance two here. So there's two components here. I change my distance and I change my angle. So there's two. There's how would I? What's well, that would just be polar coordinates then. Okay. Um, so how do I do this in polar coordinates? Um, how do I end up with um, uh, the trick that I want to do here? The question I'm going to answer right now is. Imagine I have a I have a uh, non-polar coordinates. I have a uh, Cartesian coordinates for the room, and I want to express I want to express uh, this distance. Um, uh, um, do I want to express the Cartesian coordinates? I don't know what I want to do here. Um, uh, well, the my position is in Cartesian coordinates, so I have a position. In here, which reference frame? In the reference frame of the room. Okay. So there's two reference frames of the room. There's a there's a Cartesian coordinate, and there's also a polar north, if you want to call it that, right? Um, and so I well, the, the I, Cartesian coordinate would would take care of this. It would also have an angle. It just the well, axes will give you the angle. You know, well, the, well, the axes define kind of a canonical angle. Uh, yeah, but I I don't I don't uh, let's say. I, I don't get to measure that. Uh, all I get to measure is this change here. So imagine, um, uh, uh, I have I have theta and phi or phi, and um, so I get a delta angle, um, and I have a delta distance. So I'm, gi I'm giving you. Imagine I give you this. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you your x y position, x y z position in the room. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, a distance one, a distance two, and a delta uh, a change of angle. Those those are the things I'm giving you. That's 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 what I can directly measure. Mm -hmm. um, and um, well, maybe I can directly measure the. The angle relative to the room and the angle relative to the room. So that's what I get. Angle one and angle two, and I have distance one and distance two. And what I want to calculate are um, um, I want I want to get the let's just for the grins. Let's say I want to get the linear distance um, uh, between these two and. Um, and and I want to I want to get I want to get this this vector the, the green vector not the, the black vector I want to get the black vector uh, the black vector you can't do with just two points well why not I, I, if, I, if I tell you where I am I give you my X Y Z location here I give you this angle I give you this angle I give you this distance and I give you this distance and that defines that def uh, that defines a point location here and defines a point location here. So maybe the question is yeah because you can't tell that because suppose you rotated this object while still keeping this point there yeah those all would have different black yeah, yeah, so yeah, you yeah. can't tell just from well, those no points. I'm not, I, I didn't I got rid of these objects I just get, I'm just said this give you two points oh, but the, I thought the black vector was about uh, was the I'm, object I'm, object I'm, displacement no I, I but we're not I'm not even doing that now. Okay. okay. Then it's much. Then it's trivial. So, um, so uh, it may be trivial for you, but help me out. <laughs> so I, I have an angle and a, I have an angle and a distance and an angle and a distance, and now I want a, I want a new angle and a distance. So yeah. So for for each of these, you can figure out where this is in this reference frame, and you just compute the okay. difference. Okay. I can't. Can I do it without? Can I do it without going to the parent reference frame? Can I do it? Um, yeah, you can do it in any of these references. You can do it in this guy's reference frame. No, no, I mean, can, um, as I've defined the problem, um, you're saying, OK, take this distance, this vector, calculate this point, take yeah. this and then calculate this point, and then, um, subtract, them. And then subtract them. I, mean, I can't write down the equation. I mean, but, that, but that to do that it just sort of requires like a, a trig function or something, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, we don't have we don't have trig functions. 
<laughs> I'll get you the trig functions. <laughs> So well, I mean, the trig like, functions are easy to learn. Like, they're they're easy to learn. Easy to learn. I mean, they're pairs they're of object vector cells. Yeah. Could, uh, the, some, yeah, so some, the black arrow could be read out from a pair of those green cells up there. Yeah. How do I read it out? What do you mean I read it out? I, I can, oh, I have two cells. It's so unique given those two, and then you, you have to learn the mapping, or you hard code the mapping, or whatever it is. So you're saying, as I do this, Sweeping of the thing here, I would. You think that's equivalent to having two of the yeah. object vectors? Yeah. You, you attend to one. One of these green cells lights up. You attend to another. Another green cell lights up, and then you take the. It's, it's, that is the displacement between them. That pair is unique to that particular. Oh, is that, are you saying yeah. as I had? As if I had two objects here, and um, are you saying it's like this? Uh, yeah. Uh, I have two objects, and now I'm at some location uh, here, which responds to this. Yeah. And then when I'm here, there's another cell. It doesn't have to. Be, there's another cell yeah. that that it's not this one. This is cell A, and there's a cell B that also responds to that. Yeah. So it's one. Yeah. And so here I have. This is helpful. So here I have two cells that become active. Now you can think of it as really two populations that become active. Uh, the population A and the population B. And um, I mean, it's useful just to picture this could be that it could have been this cell and this cell. Yeah, yeah. Like it could have been that. The problem is these are not cells. These are locations relative to this object. The physical cells can be anywhere, right? Sure. Right. That's what I'm trying to. I, I always sort cells visually into the well, space. Well, but, but, I, but I don't think I can because this cell can. There's a cell that responds to this and a different cell. When I'm here, there's a cell that responds to this and there's another cell that responds to this. And so really, the, the way I think about it, there's a sparse population that responds when I'm here, attending to this, and there's a sparse population that responds when I'm here, attending to this. Um, and, uh, and you're saying that just, so I have sparse plus sparse, and it's just, if I can, the, the goal of a displacement is to say, well, given me, give me this um, in a movement, I should be able to tell you that. Right? That, that's what displacement cells do. Displacement cells go between. You're trying. You're trying to figure out the the new green cell to activate the new. What do you mean? Uh, okay. So when I'm here attending to this object, yeah, I have a, I have some set of object vector cells around. Right. Yeah. When I'm here, same. I have a move, but I now attend to this object. Yeah. I have a different set of. It's the same population of cells, but I have a different subset. Yeah. Right. And, and so what we're saying here is, what do our old displacement cells do? Our old displacement cells go between, uh, you have either you know, space, uh, space number one, space number two, and the movement. And you can go either way. You can say, give me space number, my location space number one, give me movement, I'll tell you the location space number two. Give me location space number two, I'll move you to this one, right? So that's, my, that's the same thing here. I have a, 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 a population of cells, I have a movement, which is a rotation or, you know, and um, and now I'm going to have a different top population of cells. Mm -hmm. So if I can consider, if I can take like our movement, our displacement algorithm, the one we already have, and just apply it to these populations of cells, um, I'm going to have to think through what that means. But if I can take the exact same mechanism and apply it to these two pop, this this set of cells are not green cells; these are object vector cells. But it's the same idea, sparse coding, uh, representing the location, and um, and now then she says, okay, I have a movement, and now there's a different one. So basically I want to be able to say, given this plus a movement, I can predict this, and given this plus a movement, I can predict this. That's what we need uh, in some sense. Um, and what, what's the theory that here's what we want to have happen, that if I'm over here and I'm doing this, that if, this, if the displacement one works here, displacement one would work here. That, that would be the goal. That would be saying, I've now calculated the displacement between these two objects that's independent of my position. That, that this displacement vector will represent the relationship between, and by that I mean I can be at one location, move, I know my other, I know where I'm going to be another one. This is all just paralleling the existing displacement model. Um, that would be, I think, might be the goal. I'm, I'm pointing that out, I haven't thought about it carefully, but that. To me, that should be the goal. That whatever I do to calculate the displacement between this this population and, and this population, 
I should get the same displacement when I go from this population to this this population. And now I have a I have a, a viewer independent representation of the displacement between these two points or these two objects. You following all that? It, it makes sense to you? Yeah. Okay. You missed the displacement so much. This is what I've been trying to get at over and over and over again. There's this parallel construction going on in orientation as in the and, uh, and so now I'm arguing, I said this on Friday too, I'm arguing that there's a displacement vector equivalent for, um, for when I'm not moving my location, but I'm just changing my angular position. Uh, and phrasing this in object vector cells is very helpful because now I can say, oh, there's a population of cells and a population of cells and you said, and you said, it's just like, oh yeah, it's, it's displacement between those two. For you're saying a cell, but I'm saying it's population to population. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, again, I'm not saying the same thing again. I'm just saying, if I calculate, this is a different set of cells, and this is a different set of cells, but the displacement between this cell and this cell should be the same as the displacement between this cell and this cell. That's, um, that's the requirement. Mm -hmm. Which is very, very close to what we did with displacements for location. Didn't matter where you were, you end up with the same displacement cells uh, after a particular movement. So here we're going to end up with the same displacement cells. Uh, it's the same thing, I don't have to say it again. That is a very nice pro uh, problem definition. Our, our existing mechanism might work. I don't know, I don't know what, I have to think about it. But instead of, take the existing mechanism where we, we assume there's a bunch of grid cell modules. Forget that. Replace it with a bunch of, uh, of uh, with a bunch of um, like head direction cell modules, something like that. Uh, or yeah, somehow I don't know how you replace it, but you want or to replace it. You could draw up that network. What you say? I think uh, you could draw up that network. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically the same idea, except we're just using head direction and we're uh, orientation versus grid cell modules. Um, I mean, yeah. The the easy version would. Would essentially get the uh, would would essentially get the displacement between this point and this point, but that's not precisely what, what we want. Well, I, I, is my problem definition not precise enough? Uh, my problem definition is two, four. I'm talking about four different sets of object vector cells. I'm saying the e the easy version I could draw right uh, now. Oh, the easy version would, would, wouldn't work because why? Well, just uh, the same thing. Uh, the perimeter of the object. We we want something that wor works for multiple viewing angles of the object. Well, well okay. But now I phrase the problem in terms of object vector cells, which we know exist, right? And object vector cells, if as you said, it's the perimeter of object. We don't have to ask how that occurred necessarily, right? We didn't, we don't we don't know how object vector cells come about necessarily. But if I postulate there are object vector cells that behave like I said, then forget about the perimeter and all that stuff. Can we just, it may work for the perimeter, but can we just say that the point is I, I should be able to get this displacement between these two? I, I guess we're trying to separate the fact of how are these object vector cells created is sort of an independent question about just assuming that there's two populations of cells. Uh, there's a set of cells that represent your location via object vector cells, and and now um, we're just trying to find the displacements when I rotate. This is exactly what I was trying to get at, is like you attend to an object, then you get one set of object vector cells. Then you attend to another object, you get another set of object vector cells. Uh, because attending is in some sense saying, no, only, only attend to this thing and only attend to that thing. Um, Just to make sure um, your environmental models are in sync on this, I think you, uh, I'll just say it. Um, the same set of cells is used for different objects. So, like, um, if if the attention idea is right, then that means when you're attending to this object, these same cells are anchored to this. Uh, when you attend to this, suddenly the same population of cells 
Uh, yes. That is around that. Yes. Uh, and now, and, and that's, that's just our interpretation we're putting over it. That might be correct. Um, they did experiment with multiple objects, um, and they did find that um, that when there are multiple objects, um, the, the the firing map of the cells behaved um, in the expected way, where like, where like this cell fires here and here. Uh, the, the cell fires here and here. They didn't do any try. They didn't try to. Um, they didn't try to do any temporal um, untangling. They didn't try to make sense of was the animal attending to here or here. Uh, I, like if I were to guess, I bet they have a bunch of recordings. They're quietly working on a paper right now where they showed how the neural population juggled between the two, time mm -hmm. multiplexing on some cycle. I bet they're writing that. Well, paper. it's also it's very but, complicated because you know. Um, if I see these things, imagine I saw these things right next to each other all the time. Maybe they're a little bit closer. I might learn them as a single object. Mm -hmm. And now everything's changed. So part of the thing is, part of the way I think this mechanism works is that when we look in some direction, we, if we don't recognize it right away as a unique thing, we keep narrowing our attention, our focus down until we recognize something. And then you say, OK, it's just that. And then I say, OK, and it's just that. But after I, after I learned this, I might see this as one thing. And so I look in this direction, I now have one thing in this direction. I don't, it's, I've learned this as a pairing. Um, and so it's really depending on what the rat's doing and what the rat's thinking. I mean, I can even look at my chair and say, okay, I just recognize that as a chair. I know that as a chair. But now I can, even though I know it's a chair, I can now attend to the, some subset of the chair as if I hadn't learned the chair yet. And, and so as I'm doing that, all these things will be changing. So it, it, there's a lot of internal uh, mental stuff going on while representing what's happening here. You know, so um, you know, even in this box, I could just say, "Oh, let's just attend to this this little symbol up here in the corner," um, and then I would get a different set of object vectors. <laughs> um, so this sort of cascade of uh, parent child parent child things going on, and and um, um, I don't know, I can't say better than that, but. Um, so maybe they have data on it, but the data might be very conflicting or confusing. Or they don't really know what's going on in the mental mind of the rat or mouse. Um, in this case, though, we could we could just ask from a purely theoretical point of view, assuming that I have a unique population for each of these four vectors, uh, same set of cells, but unique population, um, population code. Um, can I calculate? Uh, can I come up with a displacement function that where uh, the displacement between these two is the same as the displacement of these two? Well, keep in mind that here the vector is actually, I'll do green, but it's going to get messy. I'll do dash of line. Keep in mind here the actual group line is going to be a different vector. Uh, what do you mean? Well, it's going to, it's, since it's to the perimeter of the object. Oh, I, oh, I didn't, I just picked, I just picked whatever point you want, the perimeter, fine. I didn't mean, I didn't oh, mean that. Oh, got it, okay, got it. I, I didn't mean that. I was being sloppy. It's just, uh, yeah. Whatever, whatever, whatever preferred point you want to pick. Just the, as you drew it, it was a very simple problem, but it's actually complicated because these two vectors point to different points. Uh, this one uh, should point to right. So that's part of our problem too. Right? Yeah. So you're pointing out that this is going to point here, and this is going to point here. Yeah. Uh, the requirement is. Um, The requirement is that D1 and these two displacements have to be the same. Even though I'm looking at different parts of this thing, I'm looking at different positions, uh, it, it, they're going to be at different scales. Uh, you know, now, I'm now this one's bigger, this one's smaller, but I think that's, that's all part of the, 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 I think that's what's going on in the thalamus, you know, that whole scaling mechanism of the thalamus. Is that, as you do these attention things, the thalamus is calculating the distance. Or the 6A of thalamus is calculating the distance. It's complicated. But it's beautiful. Yeah, love it. If we phrase the problem in terms of these displacements and start there, that these have to be equivalent, then, then these complications might resolve themselves as we go through the process. Because here's a fact. I'm saying this is a fact. This is going to be equal to that. That's the definition of what we need. And um, and then all these other complications here are going to have to 
we have to start from that fact. And um, that'll help us and guide us to the right solution. And of course, at any point in time, there's multiple columns recognizing this, and there's multiple columns recognizing this. So there's this population going on, but each column has its own set of uh, object vector cells. Um, so it might require, it might, I, I think, it would ideally not require any sort of um, uh, multiple column voting or anything like that. I might, I might have a single column that looks up here, and it, it has to move a little bit to infer this object. And so now it has a stable representation of the object. It knows what the object is, even though its angle here is changing, and what point of the object it's looking at is changing. And then it swings over here, and now it, it, it's going to recognize this object, uh, even though its position might be changing. So it's like there's a, if I can have a stable representation of this object and a stable representation of this object, then I'm going to figure out the displacement of the tunum. Um, Or just our regular displacement cells could work. Uh, oh, I don't know, it's just too complicated. Yeah. I decided this, this, our exercises here are like simulated in Italy, where if you try too hard to solve a problem, it just you end up with down dead ends, and we have to you have to take it slow. You have to go very very slow. You don't want to push it too hard. You have to let it sit for a couple of days, sit for a couple of days, and then the answers sort of come out. Put in some randomness. Yeah. Well, there it, 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 I've really noticed is that it, it, I seem to make progress when I don't think about a problem, <laughs> and then you come back to it and you think about it a little bit, and then you go, oh man, this is no idea. Okay. That sounds like we're done. That sounds like we're done. <laughs> that was great. I, I'm really excited about that. All right. Done. We've done that. Do you want to take a question? <laughs> what was the question? Why do you need to know the exact displacement from one spot on object A to one spot on object B? We don't. We need to, we need to, but the point is we need to have, uh, we're, we're not focusing on the exact spots. We're focusing on the fact that you need to have the same displacement uh, representation, um, uh, regardless of where you're actually, I mean, it, it, that's part of the solution, not not part of the problem statement. The problem statement is we have to have the same displacement, and whether and we don't know exactly what it means on the same spot. We do know that a single column, a single column, will be looking at only some portion of this, and when it moves, that column will be looking at some portion of this. So if this is all contained within a column, then the column has to figure out a displacement from this to this which is going to be the same as if it was from this to this, or it's going to, or in fact, anywhere here to anywhere here, and, and uh, it has to end up with the same displacement. I don't know how that happens. It's, we don't know the answer to that question, but that would be the definition. It doesn't matter. It's almost like it has, it has to know about the entire object, so it's going to go from object to object, not from point to point, but it's observing a point at one time. It's almost like maybe I have to, I have to represent I have to have a pooled version of the object and a pooled version of the object. I'm doing the displacement between those two. To clearly, I have to look at this point, swing over here, and look at this point, not this point. And I have to have the same displacement. So that's an interesting twist on the problem. That was a good question, but not an easy answer. <laughs> All right, done. Thanks for the question. <laughs> Wherever that was. Thanks, David. Hi, David. <laughs> thanks, David. All right, thanks, everybody. I'm going to shut off the stream. We'll, I could go. I'm going to raise somebody. I'm going to raise somebody. <sighs> Howdy. Let me go find somebody to read real quick. Give you give them eight viewers that we currently have. <clears throat> okay. Is anybody in particular you'd like to see me go to in the science science Twitch community? Oh, 
could do. Uh, oh, Nick Larson is doing some AI stuff. Let's do him. So let's do that. He's actually working on some. It looks like neural network type things. So let's do that. Hey, when you get there, tell them where you came from, right? And use use the Rio brain. Use the emote. When you get there, use the emote. <laughs> that way he knows where you guys all came from. All right, am I reading? Should be reading now. I don't have permission. Oh, that's weird. There we go. <clears throat> all right, in a few seconds, we will be ready to go. I don't. I'm still streaming, so. I'm almost done. Okay, I'm just getting lunch. Okay, bye everybody. Here we go.